Welcome to my presentation. I am Gilles Simon from the Université de Lorraine, and today I am going to talk about Jan van Eyck's perspectival system elucidated through computer vision. The first central perspective representation appeared in Italy in the second quarter of the 15th century under the impulse of the Florentine architect Brunelleschi. According to his biographer Manetti, this man invented around 1415 an optical device called the Tavoletta, which made it possible to see a central perspective representation of the baptistery of San Giovanni, seen from the threshold of the Florence Cathedral, over the real world. According to Manetti, this Tavoletta consisted of a wooden panel with a hole in it, on the back of which was painted the baptistery over a sky that was let mirror so that the real sky was reflected in it. The view of the panel was obtained by means of a second mirror on which the painting was reflected together with the real sky and the eye of the user through the hole. In this way, the user could verify the alignment between the painting and reality. Some art historians believe that Brunelleschi constructed the representation geometrically by combining a plan view and an elevation view of the baptistery. Others believe that he painted the baptistery directly on a mirror with his back to the baptistery. In any case, this device certainly contributed to the discovery of the first laws of perspectives, such as that of the horizon line passing through the principal point, represented by the reflected eye, and that of the orthogonals converging towards the principal point. And indeed, after Brunelleschi's experiment, the painters of the Quattrocento began to paint pictures of artificial scenes using these laws. The Brunelleschi experiment is nothing else but augmented reality, but it is static augmented reality. A few rare artists, such as Paolo Uccello, also painted polyscopic perspectives called nomadic, which allowed the viewer to move in relation to the painting while obtaining several central views of the scene. It remains that artificial perspectives generally break free from an important parameter of Brunelleschi's experience, the maximum aperture of the human eye. The consequence, especially in short distance representations, is an amplification of the perspective effect on the border of the painting, which is foreign to our habits of perception. At the same time, in the country of Flanders, Jan van Eyck was going his own way. His paintings do not show any disturbing perspective deformations. Compared to Dirk Boot's setting, the one in Van Eyck's Arnaud Fini portrait looks more natural. The reduction in sailing distortion was achieved by making the sailing joist meet at a point higher than the meeting point of the four lines. After all, there was no reason for Van Eyck to use only one, one principal point. However, the other parts of the painting are more problematic. Several vanishing point arrangements have been suggested, but none of them have been universally accepted nor proven to be reproducible from one painting to another. Finally, most art historians believe that Van Eyck used an empirical perspective. And the first correct perspective of Flemish art is attributed to Petrus Christus for this painting dating about 15 years after Van Eyck's death. In an article published in the Art Bulletin in 1991, James Elkins complained about a lack of precision and reproducibility in perspective studies of Van Eyck's paintings and suggested that computer methods could be used to gain objectivity. About three years ago, we proposed a method for automatic detection of the horizon line and vanishing points in photographs of urban environments. This method was based on the so-called a contrario methodology, which allows to detect convergences of line segments that cannot be due to chance. A painting certainly does not present with the same characteristic as photographs of urban scenes. Few edges are often exploitable and their knowledge may be imprecise due to their delineation by the scholar or, or their representation by the painter. 
I therefore adapted our method to integrate a probabilistic measure of the consistency between a vanishing point and a line segment, which takes into account the uncertainty on the extremities of the line segments. This map shows the probability distribution of a vanishing point in the Arnold Finney portrait based on this consistency measure. And these four points are the ones we get by applying the contrario detection method to this map. As you can see, these four points are aligned periodically along a slightly inclined vertical axis. The color of the lines joining the delineated segments to the vanishing points are represented using a color map ranging, ranging from dark blue for zero consistency to light yellow for a maximum consistency of one. We see that the consistency is excellent for most of the line segments. These numbers shown in green indicate how many times in this painting point meetings as meaningful as the detected ones are expected to occur by chance given the total number of segments. The four numbers are much less than one, indicating that these meetings cannot be due to chance. Applying this method to four other paintings by Vonage, we obtain vanishing point patterns similar to that of the Arnold Finney portrait. Here in the Dresden triptych, three vanishing points are aligned periodically along an inclined vertical axis. The same applies to the Luca Madonna, painted by Fanek in 1436, where this pattern is accompanied by a perspectival collage at the level of the chair. This painting is interesting because its attribution to Vanek is still uncertain. Here we have two horizon lines, each with two vanishing points corresponding to the same directions in space. This should, in my opinion, dispel doubts about the attribution of this painting to Jan Vanek. The Madonna in the church, probably painted by Vanek towards the end of his life, also shows a similar pattern, also the periodicity is broken which is probably due to the presence of a collage corresponding to the trifrium of the nave. This collage probably comes from a miniature in the Milan Turin house attributed to Hen G, who many believe to be Jan van Eyck. This miniature has exactly the same vanishing point as the Madonna in the church and the same geometric inconsistency at the level of the line joining the keystones, which should meet the vanishing point. In conclusion, we found in these five paintings a singular pattern which constitutes a real secret signature of Jan van Eyck, the discovery of which may help to solve other attribution issues. But this pattern reveals much more about van Eyck's technique. The precision of the strokes and the convergence in a painting as small as this one, 14 centimeters wide, excludes any possibility of approximate representation of space. These lines were constructed geometrically or drawn through a glass or a mirror. But the perspective construction of a church choir would be extremely complex. This choir was built in the shape of a half decagon, and you can verify that the vanishing points are consistent with this geometry. Such a construction was not possible at that time. For comparison, the horizontal line segments of the shutter in the geometric construction of Petrus Christus do not even converge on the horizon line. This leaves no doubt as the use of an optical device to represent space. This device had a glass window or a flat mirror, and I will use the term glass in the generic sense, on which he drew the scene strip by strip with a transferable carbon ink by observing it from several viewpoints aligned along an inclined view axis. The viewpoint changes during the painting process induce a parallax phenomenon, which we can see, for example, in the Arnold Finney portrait, by vertically flattening the painting. An interesting observation is that this edge on the left of the window is not affected by parallax. We can deduce that Van Eyck used points on this axis to align his strips. With this information, we can reconstruct in 3D the axis of view and a part of the scene represented in the painting and simulate the realization of the Arnold Finney portrait. I 
according to our calculations and considering that the piece of furniture under the window has a height of 65 centimeters, which previous authors have established on the basis of data from the time, we can calculate that Van Eyck started the painting from the right eye in a seated position and finished it from the equivalent of the left eye in a standing position. This video shows the complete process. You see here, for example, how the first strip was aligned on the second view based on a point on the alignment axis. Following this alignment, the new strip was painted, then Van Eyck moved to the next view and repeated this process until the underdriving was completed. We can see that the painting, as we know it, overlaps perfectly with the simulation. And so, by allowing the painter's eye to move during the painting process, and the painter to temporarily register the drawing with reality, the Advanex Perspective Machine prefigured mobile augmented reality devices six centuries ahead of time. The underdrawing seems to confirm our model. Some of the strips, in fact, have been represented from several views and are superimposed in the drawing. For this reason, vertical shifts appear at the level of the shutters and Giovanni Arnolfini, and these shifts could also be obtained by overlaying the simulated views with quite similar effects given the fact that the virtual Giovanni has no thickness with the reconstructed model and the real Giovanni may have moved slightly between the execution of the strip. These results leave several questions open. The first question is obviously, why did Van Eyck design this machine? Did he want to paint nomadic perspective? This seems unlikely. What sense would it make to visit the painting moving along these four points? May we talk about mental nomadism? Indeed, in the Arnolfini portrait, when we look at any object of the painting, we are mentally teleported to its height. And this would be quite consistent with Van Eyck's naturalistic project, who probably wanted to get closer to human vision. Indeed, most of the time our neck is at rest and we see objects in front of us. Moreover, by reducing the field of view to horizontal strips, Van Eyck avoided large perspective distortions. We see, for example, how the sailing goes up between the lowest viewpoint and the highest one finally kept by Van Eyck. Finally, as I mentioned, the horizontal distance between the bottom and the top viewpoints corresponds exactly, according to our reconstruction, to the interpopulary distance of a man. Did Van Eyck simply want to symbolically represent human vision at the very heart of his optical device? Or did this stereoscopic view allow him to depict objects from several angles and ultimately choose a version that best suited his aesthetic and symbolic intentions? Another important question is how Van Eyck accessed this technology. Did he follow the path of Brunelleschi? There are indeed similarities between Brunelleschi's device and that of Van Eyck, the former monoscopic, the latter polyscopic. This proximity of the two devices could revive the hypothesis of Jan's trip to Florence, which some historians defend for iconographic reasons. But the process may also have originated in the evolution of the portrait technique. On the left, you can see a portrait as they were done in the Duchy of Burgundy in the early 15th century. On the right is a portrait of Cardinal Niccolo Albagati by Van Eyck in 1438. Obviously, something happened. This miniature from 1403, brought back by Otto Percht, shows a noble woman making her self-portrait by looking into a mirror. Did Van Eyck have the idea to draw directly on the mirror? The vertical partitioning of the Arnolfini portrait seems to plead for the second hypothesis. The strips seem to divide Giovanni Arnolfini into areas of interest, 
in particular the small one in the middle of the painting that seems to be devoted to Giovanni's hand. This observation leads me to wonder about the Adam of the Ghent altarpiece, whose point of view of the foot seems to me different from that of the face, and whose execution constraints may well have motivated Jan van Eyck to design his periscopic perspective machine. Thank you for listening.